What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. And this is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top experts teach you what really works to boost your business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, eight-figure businesses Come together live and in person to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. And check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only. Today, I'm really excited. We have Brad Weimer. He started Easy Pay Direct in 2009, and it's an online credit card processing company for high-level e-commerce businesses. They especially help high-volume businesses who are susceptible to consumer disputes, the Easy Pay Direct platform currently serves more than 60,000 merchants, including Infusionsoft, Digital Marketer, and so many more. Brad, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. You know, there's so many places to start, like just with the adventure side of things. But I figured we'd start with some of the business side, and we'll get into the adventure side because I have some. Sto- I, have some- I want you to tell some stories about that. Um, you on the side of cliffs on your website, but um, you know, with Easy Pay Direct. Um, you deal with high volume and even high risk companies, right? So what are some examples so people get an idea? Um, so uh, I can give you kind of a, a brief synopsis of what risk is in credit card processing and yeah. what, the, what, what the pain point is, but risk is a spectrum. And first and foremost, um, if you are doing business online at all, um, you fall onto the risk spectrum. So the term high risk is moderately offensive at best. But uh, it is, un- it is for better or worse, the term that the credit card processing merchant account world uh, uses to define e-commerce. Um, so the, the risk that you have and what people don't think about is as a business owner, when you accept a payment with a credit card, most business owners consider that sale completed and you're done at that point. Um, but the reality but is- But think that again, in- right? Yeah, exactly. So Visa and MasterCard, Discover American Express, give consumers six point or six months from the final point of delivery to dispute any charge. So if you even even in a store, if you buy something physically, six months later the consumer can dispute that charge, and you as the business owner are responsible for either proving that it was a legitimate sale or paying the consumer back. Refunding it, yeah. You got it. And if you as a business are no longer there i.e. your business goes under, then the credit card processing company has to pay that amount back. So the more volume you do, the more risk that puts out for um, the credit card processing company. And yeah. you know, even if you have a wonderful business, I mean, some of the best businesses in the world that are behemoths go under. So We've that seen that happen, yeah. All the time, so that risk is real. Um, so on the spectrum, you know, on the, on the very low end, you have something like McDonald's, who has basically no risk. You know, people walk in, albeit not great quality, they know what the quality is going to be. Right. It's very low dollar amount. They swipe a card or put the put the um, chip in, and they walk out with the product immediately. Um, the opposite end of the spectrum is, you know, an e-commerce company that has a trial offer where you get, you know, magical a magical supplement concoction that enhances your manhood and is guaranteed <laughs> to do so in 10 days. Right, right. And then it automatically rebills you after 14 days. Right. Um, I like know, hearing that scenario. I mean, that's like the other <laughs> way under, not personally, but I mean the way other end of the spectrum, right? So you're talking about risk factors for people. They're doing a trial offer. They're doing automatic rebill. They're making huge promises and claims, right? So what are, I mean, that talks about some of the things that, you're getting into an area where you could increase your risk of, of chargeback, right? Yeah, totally. So you hit on a few of them. So you know, I laid out 15 things right there that are risk flags. But e-commerce in general, recurring billing, any sort of unregulated uh, <clears throat> supplement. So mm-hmm. there is just this whole world that we're very, very involved in the nutraceutical space. So that's one of our big verticals that we operate in. Mm-hmm. But what those supplements are, huge deal. 
um, even what media is out about them. You know, you could be selling a supplement one day, no problems. Then all of a sudden, it shows up on Dr. Oz and it goes under, you know, massive critique. Or a whole bunch of shady business owners start doing unscrupulous things to sell it. All of a sudden, that supplement is, uh, you know, on you're the lumped list. in with them. Totally. You know, that stuff, uh, the trial offer thing you mentioned is a really sensitive topic. Um, there are only a few banks in the country that accept trial offers. Hmm. We have to work with them as a result. Um, and uh, yeah, there's lots of stuff along those lines. So what are also some high risk that we didn't talk about? So like the trial offer, an automatic rebill, huge claims. What else are, are big risks that you see? Yeah, well, any kind of recurring billing at all. And the there's... This is, it's always a spectrum. So the yeah. big thing for business owners to realize is, uh, you know, what we hear all the time is, oh, well, I'm not high risk. And my, depending on where I am and who I'm talking to and whatever my response is, well, you are. <laughs> I know, you know, I know the label's bad, but you definitely fall on the spectrum. Yeah. Um, but you just have to, as an entrepreneur, you have to recognize that the bank is assessing yeah. the worst case scenario. What's an and, example of that, Brad, where someone's like, I'm not high risk and what, what was what was it? Well, we, we get that in every single category. But <laughs> right. um, the common ones are people that are selling uh, a physical product online, yeah, um, or people that are doing you know selling information online, yeah, um, and they've never had a dispute. And so a lot of people associate this. Um, you know, we had somebody selling water pitchers, right? Yeah. And they were selling, I mean, two million dollars a month. Um, a lot of water and, pitchers, yeah. Yeah, and they very much, I mean, they were like, we're not high risk. Well, I mean, the volume ultimately made them high risk anyway. Right. But even when they were at 50000 a month, um, it's it was a direct-to-consumer cons- product, um, and they're still on the radar. And all it was was a direct-to-consumer e-commerce product. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's a really common scenario where somebody calls in, and the first question is, hey, what's your rate? And the, the response is, I mean, our internal response is, look, we'll hook you up with good rates, but the reality is that should not be the first question you're asking. Yeah. Because if you're doing e-commerce in general, right. if you get your account closed or have money held, it doesn't really matter you're what rate you're paying at all. Yeah. yeah. What's the first question people should ask then? Because like you said, most people are asking, they're thinking immediately, what's my rate? And they're just going off of that. Yeah, and there's a reason for that, by the way. It's because if you Google merchant accounts, there are thousands of companies that lead with the rate. Um, and those thousands are people that are not in the, you know, quote unquote, high risk space. Yeah. So they will set you up very quickly and then they will just close you if there's a problem. Right. Um, and that's 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 the wrong approach. What you want are business owners to or uh, you want merchant account providers to get to know your business model yeah. because that prevents them from closing you on the back end. Um, so really, the you know, the first question you should ask people is, um, are, are you comfortable doing my business, you know, doing my business model? Um, but it's not even so much the questions that you ask, it's gauging what they ask you. You know, if, if the provider doesn't ask you anything as a business owner, you've got the wrong provider. Yeah. You know, if they don't ask you about your business model, if you do recurring billing, if you do trial offers, um, what's in the supplements, you know, what your checkout pages, terms and conditions look like, yeah. they don't ask you that stuff, you're working with the wrong company at scale. Now that stuff's fine if you're doing you know, 10 grand a month, or you're trying to prove concept on a product. Um, but when you're doing e-commerce, as soon as you prove concept and you're starting to scale, yeah. you need to set up traditional merchant accounts that, that protect you from that stuff. What do you recommend for that? Let's say someone is, I don't know what you consider high volume, but should they start off with a platform like Easy Pay Direct, or should they grow into it? Yeah, so, um, we work with lots of people that are just getting going and they're doing a few grand or 20 grand or accelerating into that space. Yeah. Um, what we do for people that are in that in that level is we just set up one merchant account for them. Um, and as they grow, we'll set up an additional merchant account and split the volume across more than one. Yeah. Um, and th- there's a there's a very wrong way to do that that violates Visa MasterCard regulations. And there's a, a more proper way to do that that protects both the banks and the merchants in general. Yeah. Um, so it's it's really important to work with somebody to do that, not not try to figure it out yourself. Yeah, I have a question. In Which, here. by the way, doesn't cost you anything. Yeah. Yeah, no, I had a question, and that may be related to 
is I think on your site it says you have patent pending load balancing. Is that sort of hit on what you're talking about with that? Yeah, totally. So the gateway is built, uh, we, we call it load balancing, and the gateway is built to uh, run multiple merchant accounts and automatically split the sales volume across them. And there are different metrics you can use to do that, but the intent behind it is that if you have a spike in volume, you introduce a new product, um, or one of your providers just freaks out for some reason or decides they no longer want to work with your business type, you know, yeah. not even you, you necessarily, but the whole yeah. business industry, it doesn't crush your business. You can just click a button and it diverts all the sales to the other providers. Yeah. So can you talk about worst case scenarios you've seen? Obviously, people have been burned, you know, and we, you know, you don't have to name companies, but I mean, we know stories of people being burned and people shutting down their account or locking it. So you basically don't have access to the money that you sold. What's some of the worst case scenarios you've seen with people who ended up then switching to you? Because you probably heard it all at this point, I'm assuming. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, I mean, worst case is a funny question because in my mind, the ones that are worst case are the, are the guys that are doing millions a month. Yeah. Um, or girls that are doing a, doing millions a month, uh, but it's all relative, right? Right. So, well, whatever you feel is worst case, yeah. Well, no, I'm, I'm just pointing out that yeah. like, people that are listening, um, if they're doing twenty grand a month, having losing twenty grand might be more relevant and painful to them than the business losing two million. Right. I, you know, especially when you're starting a company, like cash flow is a, a serious issue, right. especially if you bootstrap. So. Yeah. Um, but keeping that in mind, uh, we had a, uh, we had a company that was, um, selling, uh, how do I do this without giving up too much? Uh, we yeah, had a company yeah. that was selling a product and it had a refillable item. So it had a subscription that was happening with it. Okay. And the, the product they sold very inexpensively. It was their loss leader. And then they had the subscription happening. Mm. Kind of like, you know, razors or something. Like if someone's selling razors and they sell the blades or, you know, some refillable, reusable, consumable part. You got it. Okay. Exactly. Um, so they were doing a couple million a month and they had, uh, they had stocked up um, a whole bunch of the refillable, a whole bunch of the razor blades. Um, so they're, they're, basically, they're basically giving away the razor itself and then they're, selling a subscription to the razor blades yeah, and they example, stocked up yeah. all these, yeah, stocked up all these razor blades in house. Um, and they had signed a contract to have a minimum order quantity of the razor blades. Uh, and so, and then, then their marketing kind of took a dip. And so they weren't selling as many of them as they had stocked. So every month they were increasing their stockpile, their cash flow was going down. And on top of that, uh, they had grown really quickly. And so the, that initial growth from 200 grand a month, I mean, I think it went from 200 grand a month to 800 grand a month wow. inside of like two or three months. Yeah. Um, and then up to 2 million a couple months later, and it kept going, um, which is exciting, but they were funneling all that money back into advertising, right? Yeah. So through that process, they went through um, a period where they weren't handling their refunds in a timely manner. Mm. They didn't have staff. Right, so they grew really quickly, right. and so people would request refunds. And what happens if a consumer requests refunds and you don't give it to them in a, in a very quick period of time? Is they dispute. Yeah. So their chargebacks went from nothing to you know half a percent, which is when Visa and Mastercard start paying attention to you, mm -hmm. up to one percent and a little past one percent. And I mean, they uh, they lost, uh, they burned relationships with several banks. Uh, merchant account providers as a result. Yeah. Um, I mean, they must have gone through 10 different merchant account providers. Um, so as they got closed, we would have to talk to a new bank, work with a new bank, et cetera. And so the whole time we were working with them to manage their chargebacks and disputes, um, all we can do is tell them what to do. Whether or not they do it is another story. Right. Uh, and it's also internal operation thing, the customer service and the refunds and managing that, et cetera. Yeah. But ultimately uh, what happened is we, we had set up multiple merchant accounts. They kept going through them, set them up, set them up. And eventually, none of the banks in the country would work with them. Wow. Uh, and the last account closed them and held something like 200 grand. Wow. Um, and they 
didn't have it and they went under. But that holding that money crazy. and then losing the account, they had no way to accept payments anymore. So at what point did they find you in this scenario? So th that's a really good question. And it, this is full disclosure. Um, it doesn't, there are companies like that that are riding the edge of aggressive marketing and growth. <laughs> exactly. And there's, there is nothing. They would have been shut down, you're saying, probably 10 times faster if they went with like a regular type of merchant because they wouldn't have the load balancing. They probably wouldn't have someone reaching out to all these channels to get that, to keep them going essentially. Yeah. And so what actually happened is they were with another provider and the first time they got shut down, was at about 300 grand. So they were doing about 300 a month. Um, they came in to us and I think they came into us and uh, we set up a new account and we kind of worked with them through that process. Um, but yeah, they would have been done immediately. And uh, there, there were a few pivotal points where they were again done and we sort of um, pulled punches to get them going. You basically put the, revive them with some shock treatment, yeah. Well, in, in the what we do is we, because we're also, it's in our interest to protect the banks as well. So if somebody's doing something that's fraudulent, we can't help them, right? If somebody's doing something that's deliberately fraudulent, nothing we can do. But if they're doing things that are, yeah. um, that can be corrected, we can work with them to help them yeah. reduce their chargebacks, reduce their refunds, um, make the business cleaner. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we did for six months and yeah. it kept them going. I could hear these stories all day, Brad. Um, you know, talk about for a second, I want, I want to hear another worst case, but, but talk about for a second this case. You also see the internal workings of what they're using for the marketing, the web pages. What allowed them to ramp up from 200 to 800 to a million a month or, or more? What, what were you seeing? Um, well, I don't know how, I, this is going to be more of a hey, don't do this story than do this story. Okay, yeah, that's fine. That works too. Yeah, but... Uh, they were doing, essentially they were doing a trial offer. Essentially yeah. they were giving away something on the front end and yeah. then automatically billing somebody on the back end. Yeah. It's a very easy way to increase volume very quickly. Now they had a, somebody that was very good at media buying on the back end. So somebody was very good at buying ads um, and they had an offer that converted. However, that rebilling process, it just is riddled with chargebacks and yeah. refunds. For obvious reasons, you get something for free and people forget that they're gonna get billed again. Yeah. Um, and is it and that it's not clear on the page or does it not matter? Uh, it matters a lot. Okay. Uh, so th and those details make a huge difference. Um, that's one of the things that we have to work with marketers on because it is possible to oversell things. And you can get people to click the buy button, but the goal is not just to get them to click the buy button. Yeah. The goal is to get them to keep the product, you know? Right. right. And you're trying to create a have win -win. a good experience, yeah. 100%. And, and just, you know, foundationally, I'm a marketer. I mean, marketing is my thing. And before I got into credit card processing, um, I lived in the, the quote unquote high risk world. Um, so I get it, you know, but it's but it's a fine line because if you're marketing that aggressively and chargebacks sink your company, you don't have a company anymore. I mean, right. it just it, it totally defeats the purpose. Yeah. So it's a fine line. So what's another worst case scenario? Uh, I could stick with these for the next five hours. I'm yeah, sure well, you have a lot of them. Yeah, no. So we do uh, product launches are a real easy worst case scenario. Hmm. We see that stuff. Like an info product. An info product. And, you know, people do product launches with all sorts of stuff. But let's yeah. let's use an info product. Yeah. So we have people that, you know, sell a course on how to market online. Um, and the course is 1500 bucks. So let's say it's two grand. So, you know, they sell... They might do a launch and do, well, let, let me think if I can think of somebody like this. Oh, okay, so uh, info product, I don't remember the price point, but it was something like that, a um, thousand bucks, two thousand bucks. Yeah. And it was an affiliate launch. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they got together a whole bunch of affiliates to uh, solicit their lists for this launch. Right. And they had, um, I can't remember what the prizes were, but a car was one of the big prizes. It was right. like, hey, if you're the number one affiliate, you get a car. <laughs> And then, you know, number two was, right. you know, a lap, uh, MacBook or something and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, in addition, they were paying out 50% affiliate commission on the launch. So what that looks like on the back end is they're paying out 50% affiliate commission. They're paying out at least 10% bonuses. Yeah. So they're already losing 60%. Then on top of that, you know, they've got product development costs, in-house staff, advertising of any kind that they're doing. 
So what their margin actually is, I, I don't know, but it's it's 10, 20, 30 Getting percent. dwindled down very yeah, quickly. Absolutely. And the I, their mistake was they came to us probably, uh, call it a week or two before the launch. Uh, and that's, that's not a lot of time. It's, uh, it's what were they common. doing before the launch then? I mean, were they just processing with some other system? It, it was a new product for, uh, it was a new product for their business type. Okay. So they hadn't sold a coaching product before. Okay. Um, like this, uh, an instructional product. And, one of the important things to know about merchant accounts is you can't sell things that are outside of the scope of what you were set up to sell. Hmm. So in an obvious examples, like if you own a liquor store, you can't sell a car from the liquor store. Right. Um, and there's many reasons why, but this is really common in the info product space. People introduce a new product and it's, if it's not related content, right? So there are people that just have different information, Yeah. then you need to get a new merchant account for it. Different yeah. risk profile. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so they were selling a different thing. You know, maybe a week before they said, "Hey, we're doing this launch. We need uh, merchant accounts." And it was like, ah. So I I can't remember if we set up two or three, but uh, I mean, a week is you you should when you're doing a product launch, uh, you should at a minimum start this process a month before, and if yeah. you can, you should try to get merchant accounts that you can season so that they're not brand new when you go into a product right. launch. Um, so that, that I could see you mentioned that being a flag if it goes from zero to hundreds of thousands that's a big flag. I mean obviously even if you're distributing it right 100% and, well, and the question is why and the answer is that what 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 insurance does the credit card processing company have that your company is still going to be around after the launch they have zero track record for you. They don't yeah. know anything about you. Yeah. So you know the how to mitigate that on your end if you're doing a product launch, and you have the ability. If you have, uh, let's say you anticipate doing a million dollar launch, if you keep money in the bank, you know if you go to the merchant account provider and you have a hundred grand in the bank or two hundred grand in the bank, that makes the biggest difference because they can see that that money's been there, and ideally they can also see how you got the money, right? So hey, yeah. he's had a balance of. Or she's had a balance of X amount right. for the last six months. Yeah. So in that scenario, Brad, obviously it's not ideal, but that's why I like it, right? So someone yeah. comes within a week. So what do you do to actually, for one, get them up and running, and two, minimize as much risk as possible for them in this scenario? Yeah. So the the first answer is that um, in in that scenario, and again, I have to preface: there's a right way to set up more than one account, and there are very wrong ways to do it. Um, the, uh, in that scenario, we'd want to get them set up with at least a couple merchant accounts. And that's what we, what we did. Um, and the goal with those on the front end is to try to get merchant accounts that are approved for, you know, 50 to 80 grand a month, yeah. which, which sounds really low if you're anticipating a million dollar launch, but the, that number, like between 40 and 80 grand kind of flies under the radar because it's it's not as high risk. If you think you're gonna do a million dollar launch and you ask a merchant account provider for a million dollars, they're gonna to wanna to see your audited financials, your tax returns, the last six months of processing, six months of bank statements, all sorts of stuff um, because it's much higher risk for them. Right. If you're only asking for 50, 80 grand, it's easier to get those things up and running if you have no history. Yeah. Um, so that's one. Two is we, we, it's education for us, is we want to have a conversation with them and say, hey, look, you, you know, first and foremost, we want to know exactly what you're selling so that we can help you through this process. Yeah. Um, but they also have to know there's a chance that you do this launch and if you blow out your numbers, you know, if you got approved for 80 grand a month and you do 200, um, very likely you're going to have the processor reach out to you and say, hey, we're going to either stop your ability to accept payments and oh or we're going to keep 10% of your money for the next six months. Just as a, yeah, a keepsake yeah. if someone refunds type of thing. And they have, yeah, they call them reserves. Yeah. Uh, and it's how they protect themselves in that scenario. Um, and reserves aren't bad, but you have to, uh, obviously, if you, can, if you can get away with not having them, that's awesome. Yeah. But the reserve is there right. to protect both parties. Right. So right. it protects the bank, right? But 
It also protects the business owner because yeah. if the reserve is in place and you do a launch, the, the bank is less likely to close your account because yeah. they have their risk covered. Yeah. Yeah, I'd rather have the reserve than shutting off stopping payments. <laughs> I'll take that any day of the week. Yeah. What's an example, Brad, that you had to turn someone down as a customer? Uh, and maybe like at first glance they looked good. Mm-hmm. So – there are prohibited industry types. Like that's that's uh, like marijuana. Um, so marijuana is a unique one and also a very hot topic right now because mm. it is um, legal in many states now. Right. Uh, Visa and Mastercard have no problem processing marijuana, but there are, the credit card processing system is pretty elaborate, and the banks behind the credit card processors are all FDIC insured, and because they're insured by the federal government, and the federal government hmm. says that marijuana is illegal, none of the banks that process credit cards will touch it right now. So how do people process that? They don't. So right now, if you're buying marijuana, period, but specifically in stores, which is where people do it, dispensaries, Yeah, dispensaries. Um, there are ATMs inside of dispensaries. Really? Hmm. Uh-huh. I didn't know that. Okay. I mean, I guess it shows I'm not out there buying marijuana. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, it's much less taboo today. It's uh, there's marijuana everywhere. It's crazy. (laughs) Uh, Wasn't like that when I was growing up. So marijuana. What other businesses have you had to turn down? Um, So one that's uh, much more confusing to people are uh, nootropics. So Mm, really. uh, mm -hmm. So there are, and it all depends on what the supplement is. It all depends on what's in them. Um, there are just certain there are certain substances yeah. that uh, don't have enough testing on them, or are just going through testing, yeah. um, where that's a big issue. Uh, and actually, one that's kind of in between here is CBD. Um, yeah, interesting. Because yeah, what it, what is it? What are they saying about that? So CBD is a cannabinoid. It's part of the cannabis yeah. plant. Um, and there are something like 37 cannabinoids, THC being one of them, which is yeah. the psychoactive ingredient. Right. Uh, it's a psychoactive cannabinoid yeah. in marijuana. Um, but CBD has no psychoactive properties. Uh, it doesn't get you high. It doesn't do anything right. except it supposedly has a bunch of medical benefits. So it has, you know. Uh, yeah, I've read up on CBD. It's got to like for, for pain in general. Yep. Pain, anti-inflammatory properties, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So the problem is that it is, and you can actually derive it from uh, hemp as opposed to, I mean, it, it can be split down so right. that literally the plants you grow aren't generating the THC, THC at all. Right. Yeah. Um, but uh, first and foremost, people clump it into the marijuana camp anyway because it's the same It plant. sounds like it, yeah, too. But beyond that, so we were, we were in the middle of um, working with a bank to – uh, go live with the CBD solution. Currently, there's nobody in the country um, that will touch it at all. And outside of the country, there are a handful of people that talk about being able to process it. But what what they do is set up the accounts, and after a month or two, they close them. Mm. And usually, there's an exorbitant setup fee to do this. And I'll note that it's you know 2016 October 13th because this could be different in a month. Right, right. Uh, but uh, but we were working with a bank. Uh, offshore, a bank in the UK, to be able to process CBD both domestically in the States as well as all over. Yeah. Um, and we were at the finish line of doing this, and then the US government started doing uh, federal drug trials on CBD. And because it got put into this camp of, hey, we're doing federal drug trials, again, federal government doesn't like it, done. Hmm. No, nobody will touch it. What about one where the business or where the business is okay, but it's the practices of the business is why you turned them down? So super common ones, and we can work. We try to work with people on these. Um, super common one are when people are uh, when they have something on their website that uh, is. I'm trying to fit into the box of what you just said, but yeah. whatever making... box it fits, you don't have to fit into that, but whatever. <laughs> I'm just curious of, you know, someone comes to you, it's not like regulated like marijuana or something, but yeah. you just see something that just is not kosher, I guess. And 
and maybe it's something they didn't even realize. Yeah, or maybe so, it's something they're doing deliberately. I don't know. Uh, common stuff is uh, are things like terms and conditions um, or making claims in your terms and conditions mm-hmm. or uh, making guarantees in your terms and conditions or somewhere on your website. Mm-hmm. That stuff is super common. And we screen for that on the front end, but it's very easy to find. And so we have legitimate business owners that have done something like copied terms and conditions from another from a competitor, right? Or from a similar company. Mm. Which, by the way, that's that's super, super common to use templatized terms and conditions. Sure, yeah. Uh, I mean, really, you're gonna write 15 pages of terms and conditions for your company? It just, it just rarely happens. Right. Um, so that's real common for that to happen, but what we'll find are things like, you know, the customer service number was never changed. So Things the are still the old, like, website or customer service or product right. of the other company. Yeah, they're sending them to some other company in their terms and conditions. Uh, <laughs> that's smart. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, so, yeah. That, so that's a that's a showstopper. Um, yeah. And hopefully we catch that stuff on the front end. Sometimes yeah. we don't. But uh, likewise, we also have illegitimate businesses yeah. that um, clone their previous websites where they got shut down. Mm. So we'll find those things and then we'll link it to the old business and be like, okay, well, this is the second time you've done this. And if we don't find it, then the underwriters and the bank will find it. Um, and that's, that, that's really the difference. Like we're here to screen as much as we can and try to get a crystal clear picture on the front end to uh, prevent declines, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but that's, those are common, common reasons for a bank to decline something. And it's just a question of when it's going to be found. Yeah. So, Brad, why did you start this at all? This is such an interesting business to, I mean, I'm sure... You know, you don't wake up one day like when you're a kid. Like I want to own a credit card processing company one day. What made you start it? Or maybe uh, you did. I don't know. You're on the side of a cliff climbing. You're like, I think I just. It's the smartest probably thing to process people's payment. Yeah, well, it's kind of a two part answer. So I got into this industry yeah. um, because I was in really hardcore direct sales and yeah. it was transactional. Yeah. I was closing people at the table and it was like, hey. Uh, buy it now or you're never going to buy it. Right. And that's how my life was. And I, I took a step back from that and thought, all right, well, how do I change? How do I create um, the best opportunity that fits my lifestyle? Yeah. Um, I want to stick there I, for one second because you were breaking national sales records, right, with your selling. So talk about some of the methods you used um, to become number one out of, I think, like 30,000 people. Yeah, so I worked for this company, Vector Marketing, yeah. um, who is a, a recruiting machine. I mean, they bring on tons and tons of sales reps. Yeah. Um, and we were selling uh, kitchen knives yeah. uh, at people's counters. And it was a, I mean, it was in-house, close you at the kitchen table. Literally, um, yeah. Literally, yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, I was, the, I was the number one rep in the company in 2001. And I was with the company for a few years. Um, and now I've got a whole bunch of core friends that came from that background yeah. as well. I honestly... What were you, you doing know, at the time that made you so successful? Yeah, so I credit the company more than myself for that. Mm. I mean, the company had a very good training program. Yeah. Uh, it was very cookie cutter. It was like, hey, say this, do this. It was a tangible product, so you could do a product demo and show people. Um, what made me, uh, what, what allowed me to get to that point was um, working harder. I mean... Truthfully, I just I just worked harder. And what was an impactful that, part of the training for you um, that you still use, or maybe you train your staff on it? Yeah, you know, role playing. Hmm. Um, I, the, the the most uh, underutilized, uh, significantly impactful item in sales training, but I really I believe in all training is role yeah. playing. Yeah. Um, People are, specifically when you have kind of unique terminology, I mean, in payments, good God. Like, we have so many acronyms and nonsense that nobody knows what the hell we're talking about unless we distill it to a simple concept. Right. Um, and, and if everybody in our company is using different words to define the same thing, yeah. that, that's a huge problem. So, especially when people are uncomfortable with language, they need to just recite a script yeah. to embed it. And once they have done the script a hundred times, a thousand times, then they can deviate because they start to understand the concepts. 
But if, until you really have a firm grip on the concepts, don't try to deviate. Just li literally do and say what somebody tells you to because they've thought through the words yeah. and yeah. why the words should be the words, hopefully. Yeah. So why do you think you work so hard? <laughs> At the time. Uh, so I, uh, why do I think I work so hard? Yeah. Um, I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> I mean, was uh, that something that you learned like growing up? I mean, was there something instilled in you, like your mom or dad? Or I'm just curious where that comes from. Yeah, both. I mean, I think it. it I think a lot of it comes from my father. Yeah. Um, yeah, my father is a uh, very A type. I mean, he was he's just straight Boy Scout A type. Wanted to be a doctor when he was younger, so he you know went to medical school, became a doctor. He's going to retire here in about six months. Finally. Um, but I think about that, and like that is a, that's a very dedicated path where you're yeah. just grinding, and that's just all you're doing. Right. Um, so I think that's where it came from. Uh, and ultimately, sales was a blessing for me because I I was equally disciplined, just in the wrong disciplines. What um, do you mean? I mean, I was complete delinquent in high school. So really? What, oh yeah. And I'm I'm an ex, I'm I'm an extremist if you haven't noticed or figured out from the aesthetic or I don't know, whatever. But uh, in high school, that those Well, give me an example of you being a delinquent in high school. I, I'm sure I, the I, statute of limitations have passed. So <laughs> being, <laughs> uh, I, I just, I, I don't even know what that term means, but like, we'll go with it. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, on the loose end of things, um, I, you know, skipped class all the time. Um, I... I'm sending this to your parents after you record it. So go go on. Yeah, I'm a super open person. Okay. They, they know all these stories. Uh, but I, I probably get arrested 10 times in high school. Uh, never for anything uh, malicious. Um, you know, it was always sort of, uh, you know, I got a minor in possession of alcohol. I got arrested for having marijuana. Um, all, always stuff like that. Right. Uh, but a lot. Um, so my parents were highly concerned with that, um, you know, sneaking out at night, all that nonsense. Right. So how did you turn that into being a hard worker and being the number one out of tens of thousands of people? Yeah. So um, the or did something uh, awaken you? Yeah. So I, I know specifically what it was, which is uh, the people that I was surrounding myself with. Mm. So in high school, I had a uh, a friend. I. Uh, friend named Joe Martoni, who I, I would love it if he saw this and reached out to me. I haven't talked to this kid in 20 years. Let's find him. Yeah, right? I've tried. He's he's uh, he's off the grid. Trust me. I but, do uh, some research. We'll see what we could do. Joe Martoni. It. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I loved hanging out with Joe, but Joe's, one of Joe's, he was two years older than me in high school. He was a junior. I was a freshman. And um, one of his favorite lines was, I'm not a nice guy. So I would ask him to do something and he'd be like, fuck you. I'm not a nice guy. And I'd be like, ah, and I'm, you know, I'm a very impressionable freshman. Um, and surrounding myself with that, he also, like, I remember very vividly him saying things like, yeah, I don't really care about my grades. I'm just going to be a social worker and make 40 grand a year and, you know, it'll be fine. And I was like, I, that, I just remember thinking, okay, but you're so impressionable uh, when you're younger in particular to older people, yeah. but just you're so influenced by the people you're around. Even if you think it's a stupid idea, you hear that stuff yeah, enough right. and your actions change, right? Yeah. You're not as deliberate about your behaviors. Um, so he was kind of the point there. And when I turned 18 and I found uh, Vector Marketing, I found the sales company, my, uh, a number of things the peer changed. Group. The peer group was totally different in their, a few things in particular with their behavior like when, uh, yeah. made a radical difference. So Corey Lilburn was my first manager in Vector Marketing and he just had a, he's now a, a great friend of mine, but he just had a phenomenal impact on my life. I mean, he, and he came from a totally different background than me. Um, he probably had some delinquent times as well, but he, uh, he was so encouraging and I remember I had never been in a, an environment where I got so much praise hmm. for doing what I was told to do. Interesting. And, and I also get the other side of this from their perspective and why it's like this, but um, at, you know, retrospectively. 
but uh, but you know they they kind of they taught me the sales um, program. They yeah. taught me the scripts. I went out and did it, and I came back, and they said they were so over the top enthusiastic. They're like, "Oh my god, that's so good! I you know I can't believe you did so well." Blah blah blah, and I'm thinking, I I. I, I just did like exactly what you told me to do. That's all I did was what you told me to do. And, Probably most people don't do that. <laughs> well, that's what's so crazy yeah. is I didn't realize that at the time. And so that, you know, that environment, those people are what really started to change my paradigm. Um, and along with that, I realized uh, the kind of the financial incentive component of, oh, wow. So I just do more and then I get more. Like that's crazy. That's that's an awesome game. I can do that, <laughs> uh, and that's that's where it started, really. So I want to continue that after vector marketing. But who are your mentors today? Who do you bounce things off of? Who's a big impact now? So those are actively growing and changing. Yeah. Um, the term mentor is a really loaded term. Yeah. Um, and it means like colleague. You know, like yeah. yeah, it could mean whatever you. You know, sometimes it's not like even uh, someone who's maybe been where you want to be, but it's someone who's a colleague who you just, you know, get certain advice from. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there are uh, there are a bunch of people. I mean, I, you know, I'm on a, on a mission to build deeper relationships with people that align uh, with me yeah. right, or that I align with. And the longer I live, the better I'm getting at that. Um, and I, a big reason for that is I'm. I've become very, very deliberate about that. So I do these, I, I do these dinners once or twice a month that are these over the top, um, invitation only. Like this, the whole process is mapped out. It's it's a extraordinary ordeal. But the intention of it is only to expand the circle of people that are specifically um, likely to be in line with me. So yeah. there are a few people in town um, that. The, what I'm looking for now, I, I learn from lots of people. I've got lots of peers that are my age or a little bit younger, but are involved in entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, or people that it's business is a common thread, right? For you and I and many people. Um, but there are also people in my world. I've got a great friend, Brother James, who is a, uh, a musician. And he decided three years ago that he was just going to be a full time musician. And he had done this kind of on and off throughout his life, but he was making uh, decent money and just said, look, uh, what I'm going to do is figure out how to automate money for the next X amount of time. And I'm just going to do the musician thing full blown. Yeah. And the the common thread there is passion and commitment. Right. Right. Passion, commitment, purpose. Yeah. And uh, so he's somebody that I learned a tremendous amount from. I've known him now for 20 years, but amazing. Um, and then the other are people that have been down the road that I've been, that I'm aiming to go down. Right. Yeah. So I've got a great friend in town that sold this company two years ago. They were doing, I don't know, 20 million a year when he sold it. And, uh, and he's, you know, he's learned a ton of lessons. Yeah. And he's 15 years older than me or so. Uh, maybe not quite. Uh, but it's, it's an opportunity to learn from people that have already been there. So I, I tried to, I try to get, try to get, yeah. get info from where I can, but I try to do both. So do you always have the dinners in Austin or where do you hold them? Oh, so the dinners are, uh, the dinners are fancy. So we send out, I send out, um, three invitations and okay. they're always held at my place, uh, which is the, on the 35th floor overlooking the, uh, the water in Austin. Nice. nice. Um, the invites are overnighted. They're gold foil calligraphy. Um, they're sealed with, uh, a wax seal with my monogram on them. Um, and uh, they're that's they, high class. I love that. Yeah, it's, they go over very well. Yeah. Uh, and two of the people, two of the three are given the um, ability to add a plus one. And the invite is very specific. Um, it's very it's well written and it's I mean, it's gorgeous, but it's very specific. And it says something to the effect of, you know, I, I value you so highly that I'm not requesting a plus one, but it's a prerequisite. Hmm. And so, you know, I trust your opinion, but the notion of the whole thing is that life is about deep relationships yeah. and something that these three people has done has impressed me either as an individual in business, right. character, activity. Uh, and sometimes I'll, I, they'll, well, I'll write a custom version for different people, but, but that's the gist of the invite. Uh, yeah. 
and sometimes I'll fly people in for them. Uh, I've got a few uh, few other condos downtown Austin, so we'll, we'll put them up and wow. then That's awesome. yeah, fly them, put them up, bring them in for the dinner. Um, it's you know we've got a private mixologist that's just out of control. Really, one of, oh, one of the most impressive huh. uh, mixologists that that you. I mean, it's just the stuff they do is crazy. Um, there are two of them that we use, but uh, Carolyn Gill is one of them. Might as well give Carolyn a shout. Yeah, She's, what's her website, or does she have one? Uh, you know, I don't know if she has. Oh, one. Okay, uh, actually, we we actually made a video for her because I was like, you, Carolyn, you need to you need to show like, people promote your brand like this is crazy um and then we do a private dinner with a private chef uh, up on the 35th so the the drinks are at a different location and then we do that that's awesome so how many people ideally do you want at the dinner there are six, six. there are six seats six seats at my table yeah. so it's in six is actually a, yeah. a phenomenal number because it's even with six sometimes there's one person in the group that you don't have a chance to talk to um it's i've never had there's always one there's always one that's like somehow I didn't didn't get enough time with them or right. um, but you go beyond that and then you start to kind of click out and you know you get little pairs of people talking and then it's not the same dynamic um, but that's really what I've realized in retrospect I have six because I have six at my table right no I love that thank you for sharing that that's that's really cool I interrupted you you were talking about vector marketing like why you actually started Easy Pay Direct, right? So you're vector marketing, you learn hardcore sales, and what was next after that? I built a list of things that were important in the next gig. Yeah. And it was like, you know, no cap on income, had to be residual, had to be recession resistant. Yeah. And uh, credit cards, as the economy tanks, credit card spending goes up. Um, and it doesn't totally protect you, but it helps. And today, almost all spending is on cards anyway. So that's not as true today as it was 10 years ago when I got into it. Um, location independent, if I didn't say that. Yeah. Uh, it's a great well, list, by the way. Keep going. Yeah. So the, uh, there were two other big ones on the list. Yeah. And one of them was um, selling to people that I wanted to spend time with. Hmm. So I'd build a network. That's while great. I was and when I was selling Cutco, I was selling to homeowners. And there was no way to filter other than money. Yeah. So I was selling to people that had, you know, the knives are, it's two grand for a set of knives. So it's not cheap. So I was selling to people that had money. But that was the only filter. And that's not the best filter. Yeah. It's a filter, but it's not the best. Um, so I wanted to sell to entrepreneurs. So credit card processing fit that bill, um, specifically the type that we're doing now. But the other one was the ability to make a lot of money fast. And credit card processing is not that. Uh, it is a slow build. Uh, you're getting paid, you know, pennies off something, um, and it takes time to build that up. Uh, so I did a bunch of real estate investing uh, in the interim to get chunks of cash to kind of get me through that curve. Mm -hmm. And I also made some really terrible investments through that process. <laughs> so at the time, were you doing both? Like, did you know you wanted the credit card processing, or were you like, this real estate thing is fits the criteria for now, and then it transitioned? Yeah, the real estate was a means to, the end, to an end. Um, and I still have a ton of interest in real estate and I still am actively involved, um, but uh, but not, I have, I have no interest in scaling that. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a means to get the credit card processing. So you level. always knew you'd do the credit card processing? Um, for some, some period of time. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the vision of, my vision at the time was not what it turned into. Yeah. And my vision at the time was, hey, I'd be an independent agent, I'd just, um, build up a residual and then I just have a residual and life would be great. You know, I just have money coming in, um, which I don't think that's actually realistic. Uh, you know, you always have to maintain whatever is giving you a residual. Right. Um, but that's where it started. Yeah. So how'd you get your first memorable customer for easy pay direct? Um, man, uh, I've done a bunch of fun stuff for that. Uh, you know, now most of our stuff comes through strategic partnerships of some kind, but we still do some targeted marketing for high high value clients or you know perceived high value prospects. Mm -hmm. um, one of them, uh, I uh, very early on actually, I I shipped a I recorded a video. I had a video edited, and I I didn't I didn't actually it was so it was so early that we didn't I didn't have money to do this. 
but um, had a video shot like in a studio, had a video edited with me talking to the two owners of the company. Um, and they were putting on an event and I was like, hey, we were gonna sponsor, sponsor the event. And I also didn't have money to do that. So that all went on a credit card. Um, <laughs> But uh, sh- shot a video and put it on an iPad, had a custom screen created in the back of an iPad. I think it wow. Was, yeah, I think it was, I mean, it must must have been a first-gen iPad. Um, but put it on an iPad, and when you opened it, I had cleared off all the other icons, so it was just a video icon. And I actually queued up the video anyway, so you turned it on, and the video was right there. Wow. Um, but it introduced myself and said how excited I was, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that was the introduction to that's how I got to know that company. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was important. And I also did not have a Mohawk at the time. So I was just some white guy named Brian. <laughs> how did you, how do you think to even do that? You know, you're using so many elements here, right? There's sales elements. There's a direct response element. There's, there's so many elements that you that are, is baked into this. Yeah. You know, truthfully, I think uh, I'm trying to think of where I heard like, it. Yeah. And somebody had mentioned the iPad thing at some point, mm-hmm. and I just, I, I, I had never even thought about it. Um, and I, I think, I'm, I'm, fuck it, I mean, there's no reason not to give somebody credit for it. I think that it was Nick Nanton. Hmm. Nick owns uh, the yeah. Celebrity Branding Agency. I know Greg Roulette and their, their partners, yeah. Yeah, 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 I know yeah. Greg too. Uh, so, yeah, I just saw Nick a few days ago. Uh, at Genius, actually. Oh, nice, but, uh, okay. Yeah, Nick's a... Nick's a really interesting character. I'm I'm a huge fan of huge fan of him in general. But I I, I think that he made a comment about that at some point. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's where that started. Yeah. Well, they're masters at video and they're masters at marketing too. So I would I would believe that for sure. Um, so talk about the infrastructure a little bit. It, this seems like a very complicated business. <laughs> okay. What kind of staffing? Like positions do people do you need for to run this? Yeah, um, you have to have development. Um, so you, you have to be ha- have to have developers. Um, and past that, we have uh, marketing, yeah. um, operations, customer service, uh, functionally customer service. They are we call the merchant support specialists. Um, and then we have two different roles for the boarding process. So when somebody is just getting started, yeah. we have new client specialists talk to them. And it's somebody that is specifically trained to do, um, uh, they, those people have also done support. So that's the chain as they go from support. Um, if they're not on the marketing or development side of the business, uh, they're trained to go through support, then they're a new client specialist, and then they get tested into um, being a certified payment specialist. Um, and the new client specialists work with brand or work with people right on the front end. So they'll assess your business model, your products, what you're doing, look at your website, make sure all the T's are crossed, I's are dotted, and then they'll move you to a new client spe- or to a certified payment specialist. How did you come up uh, with that structure? Yeah, uh, how did you come up with that structure? Yeah, you know, I, I think that I think that what we realized was. Um, There are, there are a lot of nuances to e-commerce and to different marketing models and different businesses. And where a lot of people fall short or get into trouble with merchant accounts is from not getting set up the right way on the front end. Mm. But it is, it, it is so, it's so, it's almost impossible for, it's just so difficult to understand every single business model out there, right? I mean, there are we, we talk to just this litany of different type uh, of different types of businesses from you know Nutra to adult to information products to seminar companies to payday loans to I just they're it's all amazing. so different right yeah. yeah in the marketing models some of them there's tons of overlap right but uh, like the adult space is fascinating because they are it's so competitive they are on the forefront of innovation with marketing all the time mm. because they have to be. Um, and you know your moral judgments be whatever they are, but the marketing models involved in that space are always cutting edge. Yeah. Um, so our certified payment specialists, what we realize is they need to they need to know their shit. Like they need to know everything. So we train them on different business models, um, different industries. Uh, you know, 
all of the nuances that pertain to the legal elements of it, et cetera, et cetera. So there, and it's, it's crazy. I mean, we, you look at our reviews online or look at you know, client feedbacks, et cetera, uh, it's overwhelmingly positive and that's why. It's because we've got a super high touch, uh, really educated staff that can help them and that's super atypical it's in the hard. payment space. Yeah, what was your first hire? Uh, first hire was Gordon Williams, who is a certified payment specialist. Um, and I was at the time in a uh, you know little two room office in uh, downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, we're in Austin, Texas now. Uh, and he was, I think before that, he was selling windows, um, functionally door to door. How did you know you were ready for that first hire? I, I was not, I did not have the money for it. And I just, <laughs> I just felt like I needed, I needed somebody else to do some stuff. Uh, you know, I just, you're wearing, you're wearing a hundred hats at the same time, right. uh, and trying to figure out what to do and specifically doing cl- client follow-up and sales when you're trying to actually build an infrastructure. Very difficult. It's a terrible, oh, it's a terrible yeah. combination. I mean, because you're going to drop the ball somewhere and it's usually you drop it with a client, but you, 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 can't, you can't do that. Right. You, you have to. And so that's been one of the um, one of the tenets of the business now is the clients come first, period. If, even if I told you to do something else, you get a call from a client, the client comes first. Like that's 100% through the organization because you have to. Like it just, it's it's your brand, yeah. you know? So Brad, I have a few more questions, but what do you consider some of the milestones of Easy Pay Direct? Um, <laughs> you know, one of the, the big ones early on was uh, uh, integrating with, having a fully integrated application process. So when you're working with, you know, 30 banks, um, and you're trying to set up multiple accounts for people, the traditional way that this happens, and this happens with our other, all our competitors, et cetera, is you manually fill out a bunch of different applications. And that is a, it's just tremendously it's a time painful consuming. process, yeah. Oh, m- much less, like just super irritating. And um, so getting uh, our online application is called EMAP, it's the Electronic Merchant Application Portal. And getting EMAP up and running was, and now we're on, I don't know, version 11 or something. Um, but getting that up and running for the first time was sort of miraculous. Uh, we, and Gordon was, Gordon Williams was present when we did that, because um, that, that was my first objective. So, you know, I, I got, this, got the sales guy on, yeah. got him to cover clients, and then I cr- uh, crushed that out and finished that. And so today it's really funny because we have, Every time we have a little quirk or you know something that isn't working perfectly, or somebody wants to do something differently, people, staff, you hear staff vocalizing that, and Gordon will inevitably reach out to me in the back end and be like, "Man, they have no idea. <laughs> they have no idea what we are <laughs> filling it out on stone tablets and sending yeah, it." Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So now it's you have one online application, and once we get that, we can, we screen it internally. Everything's laid out easily for us, so we can do it quickly, and then we can hit all the banks. Um, in, in the order that we want to, yeah. but on the back end. So it sounds like putting systems in place, whether it's that or whatever it is, has been has been huge. Mm-hmm. It's all. It was also the biggest lesson because it's uh, the systems are the only thing that uh, it's what holds the whole thing together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can go on a rabbit hole on this. I'm not going to because I'm really interested in the, the software and the systems that you use around the business. I know there's many questions I won't be able to ask, but you have an amazing process for actually hiring which we won't get to. Um, but since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask, Brad, what's been the lowest moment and what's been the proudest moment for you? Um, the lowest moment is tough. Because uh, I know you've made some probably big sacrifices uh, with building this business. You know, Because you kind of smile and you're like, this was not a uh, quick money business is a real slow relationship by relationship business yeah um i think that you know i don't know about lowest um but the most challenging time yeah in in the business was and kind of one of the scariest uh actually i was gonna say going into significant debt you know it was just putting everything on a card 
but it was actually it was actually just before that. So it was actually before I made the commitment to go into debt and when I was sort of terrified with the decision of it. And it was, hey, can I do this? And yeah. I, you know, I don't I don't even talk to myself that in those words. Um, but ultimately, that was the feeling. You right. Know, was the um, I'm afraid to put uh, the I think the initial the initial time I cranked uh, essentially a loan cranked on my credit card was maybe 40 grand or 50 grand. And I just remember thinking, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know if I can do that. Right. Uh, and once I did it, uh, there was no, no choice. Once I did it, it was like, <laughs> all right, well, now we're going. Uh, but I think that that I think that decision making process yeah. uh, and kind of the, the self talk and the internal dialogue at that point. Yeah. Um, that was probably the most challenging time. What pushed you over the edge to say yes? You think? Um, you know, because that's such uh, a such a tough moment, right? Yeah. Um, I think I. I you know I don't know I don't know the answer to that I think that I. Uh, I know what was going on in my life, and that was that I, I had a I had a real estate education company, and we were doing seminars teaching people how to invest in real estate. Which, by the way, is why I got involved in the the, the high risk space specifically, right? Because we had problems with merchant accounts. Yeah, so I had no. You had a pain point, yeah. Oh, crazy! Uh, that's why I built the whole company, really. But after I got out of that, I went and climbed some mountains in the Swiss Alps, which I was totally ill-equipped for. Um, <laughs> I, th- thankfully, I had. Carl Drew, who is a very good friend and crazy adventurer, um, there to keep me safe. Uh, but I think through that process, oh, uh, yeah, through that process, I think I got back from that, um, and my mindset was that it was uh, time to do this. Um, and I'm sure that we could build, you know, we could uh, build some correlation there. But the ultimately, you know, adventure serves a couple purposes and. Um, one of them is uh, to show you what you're capable of. Yeah, you know? yeah. And you have to, when you're when you're literally facing death, you're literally yeah. standing on the edge of a mountain, thinking, yeah. "All right, well, if I slip, if I misstep, yeah. if the wind blows too hard, man, it's, I'm it's dead. over." Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that it helps you uh, put things know, in perspective, reframe, yeah. reframe who you are. Yeah. Um, so proudest, uh, proudest, uh, was so far besides that proudest. trophy behind you. I don't know what that is, but <laughs> that's, those are all, those are all from vector marketing and I don't know what to do with them. I can't throw them away. It's like, it looks like you won like the PJ tour or something. I don't know. Yep. No, I, I just have no idea what else to do. With it. Uh, so, uh, the proudest really was last year and, uh, last year, um, I had this realization, uh, I, you know, I was at I was at an event. Um, I think I was at it. I can't remember what event I was at, but I was at an event, and I just I had this moment where I thought, man, ev- like literally everything that is happening in life is founded on some relationship that I have. Mm-hmm. Um, the business stuff, the personal stuff everything that I'm doing. Um, and you can, a fun game actually is to track that back mm. and think, Hey, I'm doing this with this person. Well, how do I know this person? You can think back, well, I only know them because I went to this dinner with these people mm-hmm. or, you know, I was at this location with this person. Right. So if you didn't know this person, you wouldn't know them, wouldn't know this person, wouldn't have gotten into business. Right. Um, and it was that realization that, that the driver is, um, quality relationships and the depth of your relationships drive everything else. Um, so I know that that doesn't sound like, you know, an accomplishment. Um, but the realization I think for me really, really was an accomplishment. And I think that it's helped over time to guide my actions and adjust, um, you yeah. the goals that I'm after the drivers. What's one of the best pieces of advice you've gotten from one of those people that you built a relationship with? Um, the destination is not the outcome. It's a beacon. Hmm. So the goal that you're setting is not, it's not about hitting the goal. Yeah. That is just a guiding light, right? But the path through it is, and, and that, that specific phrase resonated with me. Yeah. 
Brad, this has been awesome. Thank you. I want. I have one last question, um, but before I ask it, where can people check you out online? Where should they go? Um, BradWeimer.com is me personally. It's Brad W E I M E R T dot com, mm-hmm. and uh, EasyPayDirect.com. If you uh, do any sort of e-commerce, uh, you certainly should look at us. Yeah, EasyPayDirect.com. Last question is um, has to be an adventure question. Um, and I don't know if that's you on video, but there's some video of a kickball injury. W- was that you? <laughs> that was the craziest video. I should clip it in. It's the sickest thing, one of the sickest things I've ever seen. I think your leg is bent on a 90-degree angle where it shouldn't be. Yeah, it's totally bizarre, man. I actually I, – I, I keep it's on my Facebook profile somewhere. Oh, is it? Okay. And, yeah, and I uh, – my so my, my left leg, my foot hit – hit the third base bag and it was not a breakaway bag so my foot hit the bag and my leg just kept going oh, that's horrible oh it's so crazy I, I just want to point that out because it's crazy but but <laughs> the the craziest thing you've done or the scariest moment as an adventure as an adventure yeah um, this, uh, the scariest moments for me involve heights because hmm. um, I'm, I'm just terrified of heights you wouldn't uh, know that from the pictures on your your page, you're like hanging off the side of a mountain. That's why I do them. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, the scariest things involve heights. Um, the uh, crazy, I mean, a really, uh, yeah, crazy is such a, such a tough tough thing for me to isolate in my life. Um, but uh, I think, um, really, I think that uh, well, they're climbing mountains is. Yeah. is I didn't know if there was one in particular that was like a seriously near death type of experience. I mean, I see you, there were videos of you like doing, I don't know, loops in a airplane or something. I mean, there's a lot of crazy things that you do, it sounds like, but yeah, I'm always trying to find new stuff, man. It's, uh, what's next, what's next on your list to do? Um, next on my list is to compete in American Ninja Warrior. Really? Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I do a lot of rock climbing, and uh, grip strength has a tremendous amount to do with that uh, yeah. specific obstacle course. Um, I've had some friends that have competed in it, and uh, I don't know. I, at some point, I, I feel like doing an Ironman, but I, I've done a bunch of other like really long endurance things. Uh, but I just there's a huge time commitment involved there, and, and endurance athletics, it's not really fun. Uh, <laughs> it's you know you get stuff out of it. But it's you know you're it's, it's a huge time commitment yeah. and it's grueling yeah, yeah huge time commitment. so American Ninja Warrior is just I think it will bring out the kid in me a little bit yeah. and uh, and also just like the you know rugged dude like yeah just yeah. get it. <laughs> Brad thank you so much uh, people should check out Easy Pay Direct this was awesome thanks Brad hey thank you <laughs> what I got you can't buy it resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand right now.